so I actually think we need to give this uh, uh, some time here and really do discuss it and make sure uh, with the audience and then with anyone listening in um, that we really do our due diligence here about discussing this and um, some of the issues with the studies that have come out and of course get picked up because when you hear, you know, you eat this and it'll kill you, right? I mean, <laughs> nothing that CNN loves to grab more, or, you know, to enter in any news station there that you, you want to pick or newspaper. These are the kind of studies that make headlines, right? And if you really look at it, apparently everything we eat or everything we do is going to kill us, okay? And when we see those big headlines like that, okay, that kind of major statements are usually associated with something called an observational trial, okay? And an observational trial is where they just take a group of people, okay? Can be a group because they're all living in the same town. It can be a group because they all have the same profession. They just take a group. And they don't put them on any intervention. They don't do anything. They just ask them questions periodically. What are you eating right now? What are you eating next year? They ask the same questions to this group again. You know, maybe another year, maybe another couple years down the road, they ask the same questions again. What are you eating? And then they try to associate maybe things that they pick up on the dietary record with various and sundry problems or outcomes, okay? And so there's many problems with this, okay? The first one that's really important is that these studies are not randomized control trials, okay? They are not clinical trials at all. They're observational studies. And unfortunately, they are fraught with error to begin with, and that's because what they're relying on is for people to record what they eat, right? Ac accurately, accurately reflect what they eat every day. I will say I'm a dietitian, and I think it's very difficult for me to even accurately report that. So um, just but then this has been studied many times, mm -hmm. and they, and the people who do the observational studies say, oh, we know how to correct for that. But when you tell somebody, okay, for the next three days, we want you to write down everything you eat, you're not going to eat the things you ate the last three days, <laughs> because you know they they want to see you behaving well. So people behave well when they know they're being observed, particularly when they're writing it down, um, and so that's. And so we almost always, when we look at the number of calories that people record when they're being observed, and we know how many calories those people of that age, that gender, that weight and height would burn when we put them in a metabolic research facility and study them carefully, typically somewhere around a third of what they ate didn't show up on those days when they're recording. And yet they report this with a straight face in these papers including people from very highly respected institutions of higher, you know, that we know personally. And then they say, yeah, but we know how to fill in the gaps. Well, but th that leaves a lot of, of, of gray zone there in terms of what people ate. But and that's, I have, that's I, only part of the concern. And I have a feeling we could go on and on and on about this one topic, but we have so many questions. But, but let us just yeah, get in, just, we'll get in one, one, ahead, one, one point. Borrow us a little bit more. And that is, they're looking at associations, that people report they ate this, and over the next 10 years, a higher proportion of people ate, who reported they ate that, had cancer or heart disease or died from whatever cause. That's an association. It's not, a, it's not causality. And right now, we, we could say that in mainstream thinking, medical research thinking, there is a clash of titans going on right now between the people who believe associations are, give us useful information that even provide information, you know, you know, basis for guidelines, and people who say, the only thing you use associations for is to come up with a hypothesis that you then test with a well-designed, randomized, controlled trial. And so we have big names in, in a battle. And so what you're seeing now are the people who are on the associations, associations are useful side of that battle trying to get their information out there and make their case. Uh, so we, the public, because I'm not one of those big titans, we're kind of caught in the middle while well, these guys are fighting it out, and men and women in, in, in the community are fighting it out. Yeah, and, and there's just so many errors when you have these kinds, but they are really headline-grabbing. And I do think from 
you know, the, the really important just kind of basic things to mention. I mean, we could go into, Steve and I could probably talk about the methodologic flaws of this trial for, for the whole hour and a half and then just be scratching the surface. But to keep us from going on to that uh, uh, diatribe there, what I will say is something as simple as caloric intake, okay? Because this is something really everybody can get. So the caloric intake needed for the patients to maintain their weight in this trial was somewhere between 24 and, uh, right, somewhere right around 2,400 calories, like between 2,200 and 2,600 to maintain weight based on their gen average gender, the average um, uh, BMI, those kinds of things. Uh, and the reported calories were 1,600. So, these people weren't all losing weight. So like, where are those calories? Like, how do you account for the missing calories? And that's a pretty basic thing. So you're just filling in the holes, like with whatever. And you know, so these are just the basic problems. And this is why there's this scientific clash. And I think there is a real rush right now to get out some of these papers before we have our next dietary guidelines. And so I, I think that that, um, again, we probably have not seen the last of it. And then the other key word is extrapolation. Extrapolation, That yes. is, if you've got a body of data here, and it goes, the risk of goes from here to here to here, and this is 60% carbs, and this is 40% carbs, and they say, well, it goes up when you go from 60%, risk goes up when you go down from 60% to 40%. And they say, well, that has to be way up here if you get to 5%. And you know, your question was about keto, the you know, safety of ketosis. Well, you're not in nutritional ketosis if you're eating more than 10% of your daily intake as carbs. And if you're insulin resistant, you're really down around 5%. So they're extrapolating from here all the way out to there. there and if you use that extrapolation, I live in California. If I went 1,500 miles southwest of California multiple times, out and back, out and back, out and back, and I never found Hawaii, I could prove Hawaii wasn't there. <laughs> so they go halfway there and then extrapolate and say there's nothing out there. And we know nutritional ketosis is an very powerful, and now we know metabolically it regulates many beneficial genes in our body. It's absurd to extrapolate like that, and yet they do it with a straight face. So in other words, I'm nobody show up now. was on a real low-carb diet <laughs> in Before the whole she takes population, me out. yet they called it a low-carb diet. 